Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of God, the most compassionate and merciful. Alhamdulillah. 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 Praise be to God. We seek his help and his forgiveness. We seek refuge with God from the evil of our own souls and from our, our bad deeds. Whomsoever God guides will never be led astray, and whomsoever God leaves astray, no one can guide. We declare that we bear witness that there is no God but God, the one having no partner, and we bear witness that Muhammad is his final servant and messenger. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Please join me in reciting the Fatiha. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahmani Rahim, Maliki Yawmi Deen, Iyaka Na'abudu wa Iyaka Nasta'een, Ihdina Sirat al-Mustaqeem, Sirat al-Ladhina an'amta alayhim, Ghayri al-Magdubi alayhim, Walad-Daleen. Ameen. Today, we open this historic Joma with the opening chapter of the Quran. The words of God, which we recite the most often and which bring us here together to continue the legacy of Muslim women throughout our history and to begin a new chapter in the story of American Muslim women. And so as we begin, I first challenge you to think to yourself whether you could recite the Fatiha in English with the same kind of roll off your tongue, sincerity and closeness as you can in Arabic. The Fatiha says to us in English, in the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful. All praise is due to God alone, the sustainer of all the worlds, the most compassionate, the most merciful, Lord of the day of judgment. You alone do we worship and unto you alone do we turn for aid. Guide us to the straight way, the way of those upon whom you have bestowed your blessings, not of those who have been condemned by you, nor of those who go astray. We begin today with the Fatiha as we begin this new chapter in an intention, inshallah, to claim the words of the Quran and the message of the Quran in our daily lives and to renew our relationship with the Qur'an, with the Sunnah, with the Masjid, and with our Ummah, the mosque and our community. We gather as Muslims each week as a community for Jummah to get a dose of spiritual nourishment, to feed our souls together with our brothers and sisters in Islam, to get a chance to reflect on what we've done, and to connect with our community and to set new goals for the week up ahead. I am proud and overwhelmingly humbled to be the first khatiba to address this new community. And I send my dua and hopefully yours to the sheikha who was unable to, to take her rightful place uh, to, uh, as the first khatiba of the women's mosque. I thank you and the sisters and brothers who are involved in the board for entrusting me with this privilege and for recognizing that someone other than a scholar can give a khutbah which happens in other mosques all the time. <laughs> I take great pride in reading the Fatiha here in English because when we understand the text, when God speaks to us directly, we get the jolt that we are looking for. We get the jolt to our hearts, to our spirits, to our souls, if we look for it. And inshallah, we pray that this experience of a woman's Jummah will jolt your spiritual senses and that it will create opportunities for your spiritual upliftment. Just preparing for this experience has certainly caused me a few jolts. Now, Allah tells us, God tells us in the Quran that we have a right and a responsibility to own our faith. And there are many reasons every day and many forces that don't want us to own our faith, both outside of our community and inside of it. But the most important force of all is the one that is inside of us, our souls, that is connected to God directly. And we need to invest in that direct relationship with God. 
One of my dearest teachers, Dr. Maher Hatut, who passed away recently, may God shower him with mercy, would always remind us of a critical word in the Quran that goes overlooked, which is the word tadabbur, which means not just to think, but to think and rethink and rethink. To reflect about the meaning and the relevance of the Quran is what the Quran, what God asks us to do. To keep thinking over and over again so that we continue to remain relevant to our time and place. And that's another reason that today is particularly special. For me, Islam was something I inherited. Many people ask me when I converted, the truth is that Islam is something I inherited. My parents were Muslim, they came from the former Yugoslavia. And for them, Islam was something that they inherited. And the way that they learned Islam was through a set of teachings from their fathers, or from the, the imam of the village, or from some other authoritative figure who told them what Islam said, who told them what the Quran said. And they were not to question. They were simply to receive. And that is the Islam that my mother grew up with, and that probably many of your mothers grew up with. And then I look to my own life, and the Islam that I inherited for me growing up as an American Muslim teenager was one that was full of rules. Islam to me meant what I was and wasn't allowed to do. But let's be honest, it was more about what I wasn't allowed to do <laughs> than what I was allowed to do. And so it became a rule book meant to hedge me in. And I expected that as when I became an adult that I would toss aside the inheritance for something different, maybe something better. What changed in my life that changed me to the core was when I actually read the Quran on my own. When I engaged the text and read it from cover to cover and allowed God to speak to me directly. As my teachers have taught me to let Allah, to read the words as if they were re revealed to me. And that, inshallah, is part of what is sacred about the journey that we are entering together. Because my mother, who had nearly a fifth grade education, couldn't read the Quran properly, even if she wanted to. And so she had to rely on outside sources. And for me, I inherited that type of Islam until I became an adult and took ownership of my faith on my own terms. And felt confident that what I was reading in the Quran made sense to me. That I realized that God said that men and women are, are equal in creation that women are equal partners in their families, in their workplaces, in their mosques, and in their societies. And that has meant all the difference in my own journey and what made me step outside of my comfort zone to accept this invitation. But there was another reason that I also accepted this invitation. And that's because of the little screamer that you hear outside of this, uh, this, the, the four walls that we're in. When my daughter Layla was born almost five months ago, I wouldn't have even imagined five months ago, despite uh, k talking to the founders of this mosque, that this would be off the ground. But that I could go from my mother's lifetime, her not having direct access to Quran and Islam, to me taking ownership of my faith, to my daughter, <clears throat> who in her life will be able to consider that a women's mosque is normal, is a huge advancement in less than a century. And for that, I thank Allah and I thank all of you for making it possible. Because just like young African-American children today can say, a black president, we got that. Inshallah, my daughter, our daughters, our community can say, a woman's mosque, we got that. What's the big deal? And today, because of you, that is a truth that can never be unwritten. The job now is for us to build upon that beautiful truth. Because the beautiful truth is that today is not a departure from our tradition as Muslim women. It's a continuation of the proud legacy of Muslim women throughout 14 plus centuries who have participated in the spiritual life of their communities 
at all stages and in all places, inside of their mosques, inside of their homes, and in their broader societies, as scholars, as teachers, as leaders, and fundamentally as partners. In fact, there have been mosques by and for Muslim women in at least 10 countries that we know of. So we're not the first, alhamdulillah. Praise be to God. We today share this space alongside our sisters who have women's mosques in places like China that we know the most about, as well as in places like India, in Chile, in Uzbekistan, in the Maldives, in Germany, and beyond. This is special because you make it special, and because our hearts gather together to worship Allah together. My friends and filmmakers Julia Metzner, Metzer and Laura Nix captured in their documentary the idea of a woman's mosque and the unique power that it has. It's a documentary that's called The Light in Her Eyes that some of you may have seen. And it focuses on a Muslim woman Quran teacher in Syria who runs her own school and mosque for women and girls to empower them with Quran, with Sunnah, the example of Prophet Muhammad, and to teach them in, 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 that they can own their own faith and they can directly access the meaning of the Quran and the wisdom of the example of Prophet Muhammad. And these two women, in documenting that mosque, I think captured aptly what, this, what the power of a women's mosque is, of a women's space. They said it offers an opportunity to gain intellectual ownership of Islamic teachings, where women are active and they're asking questions and that this is a return to a golden age of Islam, where Muslim women were known as great teachers, philanthropists, and religious leaders. And this is the truth. We need a renaissance in pluralism and inclusion. And so we gather to reflect on what is God's message to us today in 2015. And so I want to share with you a verse that is special in many ways and appropriate for today. I will only read it in English to spare you from my, from my broken Arabic. <clears throat> Allah says, Verily for all men and women who have surrounded themselves, surrendered themselves unto God, and all believing men and believing women, and all truly devout men and truly devout women, and all men and women who are true to their word, and all men and women who are patient in adversity, and all men and women who humble themselves before God, and all men and women who give in charity, and all self-denying men and self-denying women, and all men and women who are mindful of their chastity, and all men and women who remember God unceasingly. For all of them has God readied forgiveness of sins and a mighty reward. It's reported that this verse from Surah Al-Ahzab was inspired because a woman named Umm Salama went directly to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and asked him, why doesn't God address us women? In essence, the majority of the verses of the Quran say, O oh, you who believe, O oh, ye men, O oh, humanity, but they hadn't seen this type of verse. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, always had an open ear and an open heart to women and took their concerns seriously and ensured that they would participate in the spiritual life of the community. That was his, his example as a leader and the one that we seek to emulate. Both God and the Prophet recognized Umm Salama's voice and the voice, uh, voices of women and the, their participation and empowered them directly to be active and respected members of their community. And that's when this verse that I just read to you was revealed. In response to the prayers, to the questioning of women, of a woman. Just like Umm Salama claimed her voice by reflecting and questioning, we too must claim ours. The world and our communities especially need our voices today. Women's voices of intelligence, compassion, justice, cooperation, and progress. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, even dedicated one day of the week to teaching women exclusively in a safe space because they complained the men were marginalizing their voices. So what we are dealing with today is certainly not anything new. 
And we can continue to use the tools that have been shown to work before us and to continue in this legacy. That is what we are gathered here together to do today. And now, let us make du'a and to ask of God, for you will find him most responsive. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. All praise belongs to God and peace be upon his messenger. I rarely memorize Quran in Arabic because it's a challenge for me. But I want to share with you one of my guiding verses of the Quran in Arabic and then in English because it means that much. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In Firu Khifafan wa Thikalan wa Jahadu bi Amwalikum wa Anfusikum fi Sibilillah. Dalikum Hairun lekum and Kuntum Ta'alamun. Which means, go forth and strive and struggle, whether you be equipped lightly or heavily in the cause of God. That is best for you if you but knew. One more time. Go forth and strive and struggle whether you are equipped lightly or heavily in the cause of God. That is best for you if you but knew. I came to know this verse because of my teacher, Dr. Maher Atu. We studied it in our weekly Quran class at MPAC, where I work, where we read a few verses each week and we collectively, re collectively reflect on their meaning and relevance to us in our daily lives. When I read it a few years ago, I felt it hit me with a wave of energy. That jolt that I talked about was the jolt that I felt when I, when I first heard it. Because God is telling us directly, in no uncertain terms, that we have to struggle for good in our own unique ways, big and small, public and private, easy and hard, old and new. And that we have no excuses. We should work with what we have. We may be equipped lightly or heavily. That's not just about money or knowledge or any other thing that we think we need in order to step forward and do what needs to be done. How often have you had conversations with your friends when you've said, somebody should, somebody should start a woman's mosque. Somebody should, should make sure that they have a woman speaking on that panel. How do you move from somebody to all right, let's do this. This verse tells us that it's each one of our responsibilities, whether, again, we're equipped lightly or heavily, to step up and meet the moment. Because it's bigger than all of us. And because there is reward, there is barakah, there is blessing in the act of struggling. Not merely in reaching perfection or reaching your destination, but in the journey of the struggle, there are blessings. There is growth. There is jolt, and there is reconnection with Allah. This verse came to my mind again when I was invited to give this khutbah, because my first thought was, somebody else should do that. <laughs> and I have witnesses. Somebody else should do that. And then my next thought was this verse. Equipped lightly or heavily, you've got to do it. That is best for you if you but knew. And so with my faith that this is better for me than I but know, I stand before you. And I tell you this because in my journey in professional activism, I have been blessed to be mentored by wonderful professionals. And mostly they have been men who have been the biggest allies and supporters and trainers of women like me, who have made it possible for women like me to do what I'm doing and to work with all of you. Our brothers, our fathers, our teachers, our sons, they are our partners in this struggle. It was this reconnection to the Quran for me that started again when I reread these verses to strive and struggle. And it has completely redefined my relationship with God. For 15 years, I've been on a journey to claim my voice and exercise my rights as a woman within my community and beyond it. I have traveled all over the country and been in big mosques and tiny ones, 
of all stripes. And I have been the first woman speaker on more than one occasion and more than I have, uh, that I can count at this point. And it has terrified me every single time. It has terrified me every single time because to be the first, there is an immense responsibility. But if no one is the first, then who will be the second? And who will be the third? And who will make sure that these legacies continue? And I know for myself that in every place that I have been the first, where I have stretched the boundaries of an existing community, of an existing space, that that community has grown as a result, that the ripple effect has opened doors for other women and girls, not just to be standing in front of a microphone, but to see themselves reflected back when they go to the masjid, to see someone that they can relate to and hear something that they can relate to. And that's bigger than any one person. I know what it's like to feel unqualified, diminished, invisible. I've learned that over and over again. But I also know what it's like to connect authentically with people and to change their minds with patient perseverance. That is what Allah, what God calls us to do, to work with pers patient perseverance, to change the status quo, and to create progress that benefits everyone. I have been done, uh, most of my training happened the way that my father taught me how to swim, which is by pushing me into the deep end of the pool, and then being there to catch me. Today, I encourage you, I beg of you, I push you, and I support you in jumping into the deep end of the pool with me, and know that we are here to support one another. Today is special for a lot of reasons. But most of all, it's special because of the sisterhood that is present in this room. That over 200, of 200 women and girls said that they would be here today, to, and that people from far, have come from far places to be a part of this community, says that we want this type of space. It says that we are yearning for spiritual, nourish, spiritual nourishment in the company of other women. And it is phenomenal. We are all searching for something. And it's up to you, whether you get it here or in other places, but it's up to you how you translate that jolt that you hopefully get into your co-ed communities, into your co-ed mosque experiences. Because this masjid, this mosque, is intended to be complementary, not competitive. It is inclusive, not exclusive. It is rooted in the Quran, the Sunnah, empowerment, and mutual support. Because the truth is that we must step up and we must speak up. While we have been fighting to hear, let our voices be heard as Muslim women in many different settings, we have a long ways to go. And this is the only data that I'm going to share, but I think it's crucial. Did you know that between two, the year 2000 and 2011, the, no, the percentage of mosques in America that did not allow women to serve on their board as a matter of policy dropped from 31% in 2000 to 13% in 2011. Well, alhamdulillah, that's a major sign of progress and something that we should celebrate. And the truth is also that we are not taking advantage of opportunities once those barriers come down. Because half of the mosques that cha changed their policies to allow women to serve on their boards reported that they have been unable to actually have a woman run for the board. When walls come down, when seats are pulled out so that we can sit at the table, we best sit at the table. And it's easy to say, I'm not equipped. Somebody else should do that. But the truth is that we should all do that. That we need all of us to take not just one step forward outside of our comfort zone, but a few steps forward. And that we should hold each other's hands as we do it. Because it's difficult to step outside the comfort zone and to try something new. But that's, again, why we're here so that we can complement other mosques. You get empowered here, you get the education, you get the, the tools that you need, and we go back 
to our other mosques, and we feed them and uplift them, so that instead of telling them what we need, we work with them to make sure that we get what we need, and that this space will become an additional option in the menu of options of Jummah experiences that we can all have. Now, locally, we are seeing change. This right here, this sisterhood that we are hopefully building and be a part of, it has a ripple effect, and we stand on the shoulders of our sisters. Sisters like Sundas Holaki, who was last year the president of the Islamic Center of Irvine. Sisters like Sister Doa Alwen, who is currently the president of the Islamic Society of Orange County. And of Sheikha Muslima Purmel, who has an ijaza from Al-Azhar University and is serving the Irvine and Southern California community and beyond with her immense scholarship. Spiritual nourishment happens in all forms. It isn't just about taking from the community. It isn't just about what we need. It's also about giving to our communities. I hope that you will today begin with giving to the very women who are sitting next to you. Spread kindness and encouragement and compassion. Fear is normal. We have to transcend the fear so that we feel the fear and do it anyway, because it needs to be done. As St. Francis of Assisi said, it is in, for it is in giving that we receive. The more that we give of ourselves, of our knowledge, of our time, of our resources, and of our love to one another and our broader communities, the more that we create the feeling of home and of community that we are all seeking. So the question, as you leave today and as you drive back to your work or your home, I hope that you will reflect about how you feel sitting here in this gathering today and think about how you can help create this feeling in your home in your mosque, in your community, and how you can bring that energy back into this space so that it grows exponentially, <clears throat> and so that the ripples that we are creating here will continue on and on and on. What will we do differently now that we know it is possible? It's not about making history, it's about building a future. That's what my teacher, Dr. Atu, taught me and it's one that I, that I think that we should all carry forward in moments of weakness and self-doubt. Because today is not the finish line. Today is the starting line. Today, we begin a new chapter together. I have said what I said, and I ask God to forgive me for any mistakes I have made. And now, let us make dua. Ya Allah, guide us and make our path to goodness easy, easier for us. Amen. Ya Allah, forgive us for our shortcomings and our faults. Help us to repent, to make amends, and to begin again in a better way. Ya Allah, we ask you to liberate and uplift all people who are struggling here at home and all around the world. Ya Allah, we ask you to please place barakah, blessings, in our gatherings at the Women's Mosque, and we ask you to place blessings in our sisterhood and our work with all of our mosques. Ya Allah, we pray for our parents, our families, and those we love. Ya Allah, please shower them for paving the way for us and for allowing us to stand on their shoulders. Ya Allah, Please shower mercy and guidance on our daughters and on our sons who are growing up in a fractured world. Ya Allah, we pray we make choices that improve all our lives and that future generations are even better than us. Ya Allah, help us to be useful in your cause in spreading good and love and understanding and consciousness of you. Ya Allah, we ask you, Almighty, to bestow your mercy on the mercy of mankind, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and all those who follow in his righteousness until the day of judgment. Amen. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise is due to God. Akuli kawlihadu astaghfirullah. Akima salat. Please make the ikama the call for prayer. <laughs>